Hi everyone and good morning. Welcome to uh, First uh, Presbyterian Church. I'm continuing my series, A Christ-Like Footprint. And today I'm going to be uh, focusing on the sacrificial nature of our faith. That is that if we are to have a footprint in the world as followers of Jesus Christ, it, it should have uh, by its very nature a self-sacrificing um, I don't know, reality to it. But I'll explain that uh, as I go into my message. I'm going to be using one of the accounts of the Last Supper uh, to uh, as a basis for this particular uh, message. But before I do that, uh, would you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you thanks for this time. And again, as I've said over the last couple of years, thank you, Lord God, for this technology that allows us to be together. I know we are all in our separate homes, but by seeing, by looking at the screen, by knowing that we are all looking at this in one way or another, that we are together as a family. And so I thank you for that. I pray that uh, you give comfort and strength to everyone who is struggling through this latest uh, uh, surge in, in the pandemic. Pray that uh, in every way you, through your Holy Spirit, would be able to give counsel and guidance and comfort to everyone who needs it at this time. And for the sake of this hour that we spend together, I pray that through your Holy Spirit, Lord God, you would uh, teach us all, guide us all, strengthen us, comfort us, uh, give us a reminder of your presence, even in the middle of what we're going through right now. I ask this in your precious name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let me share with you the scripture that I have chosen. It's from Luke uh, chapter 22, and also uh, there'll be a hymn after that. It's uh, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Uh, it doesn't have the words, so I'm just going to encourage you to just enjoy it and use it as a prayer. If you know the words, then you can certainly sing along. Uh, but after that is done, I will start uh, my message, uh, which I've entitled simply, Sacrificial. I'll be right back. Luke 22, verses 7 to 27. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the ones who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. i uh -huh. 
Well, beautiful people, this series, A Christ-Like Footprint, is uh, my way of um, examining uh, with you, uh, studying along with you, uh, what it looks like uh, to be a follower of Jesus Christ in the middle of everything that happens to us. Um, as I said to you in my first installment of this, um, uh, this series, that we all make a mark, like we all leave a footprint in life. Um, some footprints are bigger than others. Some are, footprints are for good. Some pr footprints are, are not so good. But we all leave a mark. And my question is, what should that mark, what should that footprint look like for a, uh, a Christian? And today, as I said to you in my intro, that uh, today uh, the, the message is entitled Sacrificial. Uh, that uh, by, its, by our very nature, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are to be self-sacrificing. And, and if I were to say that simply, to put that into simple terms, it means that our faith um, defers to others, uh, that it's not self-centered. Do you understand that? Our faith, by at, it, at its deepest, is about regarding others, not just ourselves. And I know that I will struggle with that from time to time because I have an ego, right, that either gets wound up or hurt or whatever and, and just wants to just look at things from my perspective and no matter, you know, forget everybody else. So I understand that as Christians, we don't always take this to heart. We don't always wrestle with it to the depth that we should. Um, but I would say to you quite confidently and quite clearly that our faith is, it is self-sacrificing. It does regard others before ourselves. So this is why I chose uh, Luke's account of the Last Supper, because in it Jesus talks about his sacrifice and, and uh, the example that he wants uh, to leave with his followers. Uh, so here we are in one of the accounts. This is Luke's account of the Last Supper. And, um, you know, despite the triumphal en entry into Jerusalem, um, things were pretty tense, right? I mean, Jesus had already told his disciples, uh, you know, chipper news, that he was going to, to Jerusalem to die, you know, and that all prophets died in Jerusalem. So even though there had been, you know, a momentary buzz of him coming into, Jesus coming into Jerusalem, 
the the things were tightening around Jesus. The opposition was kind of looming in on Jesus, and I'm sure all of them could feel it. One of the things that I thought about when I was uh, writing this particular message, and I, you know, I've noted it a number of times over the years, was that um, when they were coming in, and, and Jesus, well, this is after the triumphal entry. Uh, you know, Jesus is looking is looking for a place to, um, or wants to have the Passover uh, meal with his disciples, and he says to them, I, "I want you to prepare a place for me." And uh, they they ask, you know, where? Well, he he sends Peter and John uh, ahead of him, and he says that uh, they will meet a man, and he's carrying a jar of water, and just follow him and go into that house. It, it's clearly meant to be a prophetic um, moment, uh, small in a way, but. I think it's comforting to think about just to, in the middle of all the stuff that was closing in on them. Jesus still understood, you know, who he was. He, he, he had power that, that he was restraining, and yet he was showing it to his disciples. He says, go ahead and, you know, there will be a man. You will meet him. He's carrying water. Go with him. Follow him to this house. And that's, that's where we're going to have the Passover. As I was writing this message today, I thought, you know what, things are up in the air again with COVID and, uh, you know, just stuff in the news is as is, is, is crazy as ever. But I, I, as I read that, I thought, it's kind of, it's a good thing to remember that no matter how, you know, out of control things may seem, that Jesus still has the poten- the power to be able to steer us in the right direction. I'm not going to say that that's always toward everything we want to happen, but it is a comfort to to understand that um, both back then in Jerusalem and even now, that Jesus can can steer us in the right direction. And I hope that little bit of prophecy that he gave to his disciples as to about where to have the Passover uh, will encourage you in the middle of what is happening around us again. Um, you know, Jesus wanted to, well, he was a devout Jew, as were his, as were his followers. He wanted to serve uh, or observe the Passover meal with his disciples. And he knew his time was winding down, like uh, things were closing in on him. His opposition was near, well, as near as it was going to be, because he was in Jerusalem. And he wanted to, he wanted to, to uh, share the Passover meal with his disciples. And the Passover meal was that, you know, one of the greatest celebrations and symbols of God's saving power, having brought the Israelites out of Egypt. And Jesus reinterprets that Passover meal with his disciples. You know, he uses the symbols of uh, the bread and the wine uh, as symbols for his body and his blood that he was becoming a sacrifice that that he was going to deliver that he had the power to save he had the power to save how beautiful is that i'm so sorry when we get so wound up and think like you know uh, only a particular denomination or a particular church really knows what they're doing and everyone else is you know like off you know kilter only we know we're saved it's a shame when we go down that route when it's truly so beautiful that Jesus reinterpreted this for his disciples, his followers, and said, I I, I can save. I have the power to save. Um, and, And he says to his disciples, I want you to remember this. I want you to remember my sacrifice, because this is where I'm going in this particular message. I want you to remember what I have done for you, what I what I mean for the world, Every time you get together and break bread and share the cup as followers, uh, as my followers, I want you to remember what I have done, what I am doing, what I will be for all times and for all people. But remember this, okay? This is where I say it's a shame when Christians get caught up about it, personal salvation and, and, and only their way is the right way and every other denomination is wrong and if you have a hold a certain view, you're somewhat suspect. And um, I, I want to remind you that, yes, Jesus saves. And that is a personal thing, right? We have to, I've said to you time and time again, we have to come before God and say, I acknowledge my sinfulness, Lord God. Forgive me. I, I'm asking for your forgiveness. And we receive this eternal salvation, God's loving desire and grace to do so. 
But I think sometimes we get so preoccupied with personal salvation, with personal piety, with the sort of Jesus and me kind of mentality that is fairly common, in at least in North America, that we forget that our faith is also communal. It's not just about you and me. Again, lest you think I'm, you know, downplaying salvation, yes, you and I have to come personally before the living God and say, I am not God, you are, I wish to follow. But I think we forget that Jesus came for others. <laughs> he came to save the world. He didn't come just for you and me. And here's the thing, okay? Maybe it's not fair to say this, but it has been my experience over the 40 years that I've lived in Canada as a follower of Jesus Christ that unfortunately, sometimes this Jesus and me, uh, this I am saved and you are not um, kind of frame of mind can make for some very steely Christians that can be very arrogant and very judgmental, very self-righteous, even though they are converts, even though they have been saved by God. I, I you know, the older I get, um, the more inclined I am to see God's grace across the world to see his love for everyone, that it isn't just my perfection, my denomination, my particular church that is the only apple of his eye, but that he loves the world. And there is a lesson in this, at least about being self-centered and arrogant and self-righteous, there is a lesson in the Last Supper. Um, I mean, we understand this, and maybe even just superficially, if we're honest, because we're human beings, but Almighty God, the creator of everything we see, of a universe so astoundingly big that it is incomprehensible, really, to think of creating it, this Almighty God, in Jesus, has given up all credentials and all privileges, all authority, to die in our place. Some people say, well, that's to show the way of love. You know what? I'm cool with that. And he comes to show that nonviolence is the way, that we can't always fight our way out of everything. In fact, it doesn't work. I see it more in his salvific, you know, power that he, that he saves, right? That God is able to take the sin of the world upon himself and neutralize it and allow us to come to him and ask for that forgiveness and be given a new life. But with that is the understanding that it's not just about you and me. He has a bigger scope for the faith, right? There is something greater about the faith. It was the culmination, this, the, these symbols that Jesus used, the bread and the wine and the teaching. And John, for instance, where he, he washes his disciples' feet and says to them, do you understand what, I was, what I've just done for you? I want you to serve. I want you to love the way I have loved you. Well, these, God's letting go of his privileges for you and me, for the world, is the culmination uh, of what Jesus had been teaching all along, that to follow him was to die to self, was to carry our cross, uh, to serve one another and others, and to assume the posture of the least and the last. <laughs> it's counterintuitive, you know, when Jesus says, yeah, you know, turn the other cheek and walk that extra mile, uh, you know, we kind of think, well, I don't know about that, but, you know, because he said this or she did that, I don't know if I could do it then, and maybe for this, but maybe not for that, I don't know. It's counterintuitive, but is it? I mean, I, you know, I try to preach things, I try not to just spout at you and, and not think through what I, I'm, you know, I'm going to say to you, you know, uh, and, and like I said at the beginning, I, I, I struggle sometimes with the sense of 
you know, uh, of dying to self, of, of, of thinking of others instead of my own deal and my own hurts or my own ambitions. Um, but even though I, I, even though I just said to you, it, it seems so counterintuitive to die to self. Is it really? I mean, I was thinking, is it really counterintuitive? Is that, you know, do, do we believe that the business as usual way of the world has, has it ever worked? <laughs> I don't think so. Like, I really don't think so. And I think, I bet you all of you know, it hasn't worked, right? To, to pile insult over insult and injury over injury and eye for eye, you know, tooth for tooth, on and on. I don't think it, it, it has worked. It's no wonder then that, you know, I've quoted this a number of times over these last couple of years that uh, Jesus says that if we lose our life for his sake, that we find it. It's such a true thing, actually, if we sort of, if we wrestle with it and, and try to figure out what he means, you know, and, and for sure, one day we will be with him in heaven and, and that will be an amazing thing. I mean, he turned to the, the thief on the cross, the cross, the, the thief says to Jesus, would you, you know, remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said, today, my friend, today you will be in paradise. That's incredible. So yes, one day, I mean, we lose our life for his sake, we will find it, but I am absolutely convinced through the gospels, through the scriptures, that we find our life now, here and now. We find it by experiencing hope and joy and meaning, which then direct our lives, uh, it, teach us to use our blessings and to understand our suffering without turning bitter or against God or against other people. And, and when we give our life to Jesus, when we lose our ego, our rights, just like he did, when we lose our life for him, we, we are free of fears and greed and self-righteousness and bitterness and envy and pride, all these things that keep us in this perpetual short circuit, a cycle of suffering over and over and over because we can't get outside the things that bother us so much. Yes, we will inherit eternal life, but we also inherit life here. And I think Jesus says, don't just think of yourself. That is a form of death. It is a spiritual death. Let me say it again, my friends. Our Christian faith is not just about you and me. Do you understand that? It's not about we've got it figured out, our church is the best, your theology's up a creek. No. I, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't have standards, shouldn't struggle with and wrestle with what we understand and believe, have dialogue with one another, absolutely. But I am convinced that our faith is not about you and me. It is wider. It is communal. It involves the world, us getting along together. Again, let me say it. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's everything from personal salvation to the everyone being able to have food to eat, water to drink, a home over their heads, and no one crushing them with a boot or with authority. It's no different. All of those are part of what life should be like here on earth. We need to we need to understand this, right? That God says, die to yourself. Die to your ego. Die to your demands. Die to your rationalizations. Die to your excuses. Die to your circumstances, which sometimes can sort of influence the way we think. Absolutely. He says, die to those things and follow me. And he uses these symbols of bread and wine to say, my body, my blood, I will give them for you. Yes, salvation, 
to show the way of love, however you want to interpret the cross. He says, these are symbols of what I'm doing for you. And yet, despite this happening, God loved the disciples, right? Despite all of this is happening, Jesus is going to Jerusalem. He says he's going to be put to death, that he's doing it for them. He's telling them these symbols. And what happens? It tells us that uh, the disciples start to argue about who is the greatest. They start to uh, discuss uh, and have a conversation about which one of them is the greatest. Ah, boys! Aren't they like, they're just something else. Slap them upside the head. But no, Jesus says, he takes the time to teach them again. And basically, I mean, he's saying, guys, guys, that's not the way. He says, you know how the authorities rule over people? That's not your way. That's not my way. That's not God's way. Eh? That's the thing. That's not God's way. God's way is different. He says, think of others. The ego is not easily tamed. It only speaks for itself. It fights for itself. And Jesus says, let it go. Because it harms others. It considers no one but itself. It disregards too many people. It, it, it rationalizes too much. It gives too many excuses, too many exceptions. And so he says, the way of power, the way of the world is not my way, and I want you to live differently. Well, thanks be to heaven. As I said to you a few minutes ago, has, has the business of you, as usual of the world ever really truly worked? You know it doesn't. It doesn't. Thanks be to God that Jesus shows us a different way. It's not always easy. And like I say, because I'm human and I'm, you know, have natural tendencies, I, I can tend to think for my, you know, about myself only and find it hard to follow Jesus, you know, every day, you know, every hour. But that's what he's telling us to do, that if we do it, we find our life. We find our life, my friends. You know what? In this sacred meal, this Passover meal that Jesus reinterprets uh, as symbols of his suffering and of his salvation, he teaches them, get this, my friends, get this, okay? That the host, he is the host, right? Who has all the power, the son of the living God. Remember, he said, you know, when they wanted to, when they wanted to arrest him and the, it, the disciples were getting wound up about it, he said, look, whoa, whoa, I got legions of angels that can come and save me if I wanted to, but that's not what I came to do. So the host at this meal, the son of the living God, says to his followers, the host is also the servant. John tells us, as I said a few minutes ago, that he washed his disciples' feet. Shocking to them. And he says, oh, whoa, whoa, I want you to understand what I'm doing here, and I want you to do the same. Right? I want you to serve other people. Our faith is sacrificial. There's no other way to look at it. It's no other way. If you think there's a way out, then you're going down a road that is far from Jesus. This one in particular. Far from Jesus, for our Lord and Savior, the Son of the living God, gave of himself for you and for me and for the world. Do you understand this? Service, sacrifice, is the will of God. And it makes sense. Again, has, it, has the business as usual of the world ever worked? I really hasn't. So, as Jesus asked, said to his disciples, I know this is a different scripture, but you know when he washed his feet and he said, do you understand what I've done for you? I want you to wrestle with this. Do you understand that Jesus calls us to self-sacrifice, to dying to self? You know what? Too many people, they find ways to qualify that. Too many people find ways to uh, find exceptions to the rule because, as I've said, you know, they, either their situation is different or someone hurt them or whatever the reason is, 
Uh, they try to find exceptions to it, and all they do is frustrate themselves, frustrate God, because they're going from, away from one of the deepest tenets of our faith, which is to think of others. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Let me tell you, there are no exceptions to this rule. I struggle with it. There are days when I get angry, depressed, blue, frustrated, out of sorts, you name it. I want to chew other people out. I want to throw blame around. But you know what? I am wrong. I am wrong. There are no exceptions to this rule. Jesus says, the host, me, that is your Lord and Savior, is also the servant. And you are to be the same. So, we serve, my friends. We see others as loved by God. We don't pigeonhole them or segregate them or separate them or devalue them. We look at them as children of God. We put others ahead of our own uh, needs and desires. We support all who are oppressed and excluded. We follow Jesus in every way who loved us so much that he gave his life for us. He says, it's simple. Love, my friends, as I have loved you. That means die to yourself and treat other people the way I have treated you. And people, would not this be a better world if we did? I mean, it would. So, I'll be honest again, just quickly. I may struggle with this from time to time when I get out of sorts or angry or tired, uh, bugged by something or someone. But I know that when I stop and think, I wouldn't want it any other way than to follow the sacrificial nature of Jesus Christ. And I know you would too. And I thank you for that. God bless you. Well, let's uh, listen to another piece of music. And uh, this is another version of the Blessing Song. Uh, and it's a choir that is using Zoom. This is a different version than one I played a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago! That's nuts to think how long this has been going on. But I want you to, there's no words, but I want you to take it as a prayer. Again, uh, this is, this is a, a, you know, a, a choir from a church. Uh, they're all singing from their different locations, and it's put together. We, you know, you, you've likely seen other versions of this. It's called The Blessing. But let it remind you that despite of what's happening around us, we are still uh, loved by God. We are called to live in that love and to show that love to others and to praise the Lord and to work for him in whatever circumstances that we are put into. So let's hear that, and then I'll be back and I'll pray with you. Uh, so let's do that.
May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his you found that as inspiring as I did. I, I love to hear it. I love hearing other people just, uh, you know, do their thing from their part particular locations and they join together. I mean, it, it, in a way, it's, it's a big symbol of the church, the Holy Spirit working in everybody. And so, again, I, I hope that that was a, uh, a blessing uh, to you to listen to that, to be reminded of God's love. Uh, but before uh, I let you go today, uh, would you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you thanks. And we thank you that there are expressions of you all over the world, regardless of what is happening around us. And that if we look, we can see you in sunlight and in love, and kindness, in the work of people around the world, in churches and in expressions of, of uh, every kindness and grace that your world is full of your love and of your self-sacrifice. Lord God, help us to live together, to work together as a people. I pray that we would always, no matter where our, what, it, what our arena is, no matter what our circumstances are, that we would find ways to work with one another in solidarity and with uh, open-mindedness and with uh, trust. Lord God, help us not always demand our own rights and and things be done our particular way because this world is big and there are a lot of people in it. Lord, help us to see them the way you see them with a love. Lord, when you came off of that boat and you saw the crowds, it says that you had compassion for them. 
because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Help us to see the world that way, the people around us, the situations that we, that we come across. Help us to see, it with, see those things with the same eyes, Lord Jesus Christ. We do pray for the developments uh, in this pandemic right now. And, and Lord, I, I pray that, that uh, some of the experts may be correct, that, that this is the beginning of the end as, as uh, Omicron uh, spreads quickly, but in, in a way that allows for uh, more immunity. I pray that that is true. And if that's the case, Lord God, we give you praise that that will happen. Pray protection on everyone, though, as that is continuing to happen. And we pray in particular, I pray in particular for our health authorities. Um, they, they, they must be exhausted by this. I pray that you give everyone in administration and hospitals the, the, uh, the wherewithal, the strength uh, to do what they're doing, uh, despite criticism that no, no doubt probably comes from every corner. Pray that you would give them the strength to do what they are doing. And Lord, we pray for every, every uh, level of government in our country and pray that we would uh, try to work together as much as possible. Lord, help people make decisions that benefit the most, that, uh, that have common sense and, and, and uh, a love for human beings, for one another. Pray that in every way. I, I would not want to be in government right now, Lord God. <laughs> so thank you for everyone who is brave enough and strong enough to do this job at this time. We pray for every agency, uh, Christian, uh, whatever, uh, that is working in our country and around the world to to bring stability, to bring food, to bring medicine, to bring health, education, everything in the middle of this very difficult situation that has enveloped the world. Thank you, Lord God, for the people that you place in those positions. Um, I pray that folks here would, um, you know, we, we may not be able to do the things those uh, the, the people in these agencies are doing, but we can certainly support them. And so, Lord God, if each and every one of us knows of, of uh, agencies and organizations and hospitals, uh, that uh, we would support them with our finances and with our, our volunteerism so that we could actually be a part of um, uh, what is being done for the good of uh, everyone. Uh, not just the, the special or, or those who can afford it. Lord, we pray that in every way uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, uh, however it is, may, may your will be done. I pray for everyone in our congregation, everyone who is listening today. Uh, no doubt we're tired. We really are tired, Lord God. Help us to uh, find time to recharge, to read your word, to pray, uh, to do the things that help us center ourselves in you so that we are not just blown uh, uh, here and there or to bits by the things that are happening. I pray we would have our radars pinging too, though, Lord God, that if we see the people uh, around us in our community, family, friends, neighbors, church, uh, that we see if, that they're in need, that we would reach out and do something practical for them, some help, some love, support, however it is. I pray that we would do that. I thank you for um, our pastoral care team and the way they continue to minister to the members of our congregation uh, who are often isolated at this time. I thank you for the breakfast and everyone who volunteers there. Uh, in uh, helping to bring food to those in need in our community. And I thank you that through the agencies that uh, we support through this church in our denomination and in other denominations, that uh, that support uh, goes wider and wider. Pray that in every way, all those things would be a blessing to people. Help us, Lord God, then to take a time, take a moment and center ourselves and be thankful uh, for you. Uh, to find ways to, to find um, stability and strength and peace and even joy in the middle of what is happening by uh, searching you out and helping, you, helping us or allowing you to uh, uh, guide us in everything we do. I ask your special blessing on everyone who is listening here today. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, good people, I hope you have a good week. Um, it, it is, you know, please be careful, you know, use your best judgment. Folks, think of the wider world, uh, your wider community. I'm thankful that so many of you, if not all of you, are, are conscious of the need of, uh, to, to, you know, wear masks and to be careful about how we mingle and to, you, you know, get vaccinated, all those things that you do. I'm thankful for that. Keep doing that. Our world needs us to band together and to work together to get past this. Show your love for your fellow man. Show and uh, for, you know, love God and love others by being the best person that you can be, the most communal the most society-minded person that you can be. Let uh, your situation uh, not be the most important. But I thank you uh, that you do that. And uh, may God bless you for it, and may he bring us out of this. I do look forward to when we can start meeting again together, and hopefully sooner than later. Uh, until I talk to you next week, God bless you. Uh, may his light shine upon you. May his peace envelop you. May his comfort uh, soothe you. May his strength drive you. Yeah, I see you soon.